Uh, so, my name is Mark Longstroth, and I have been a food educator for Michigan State University since 1994. And uh, before that, I was a research technician for the University of Idaho from 78 until 88 when I went to MSU. And so, I have spent a lot of time in fruit production, and I've become an expert in blueberries. I won't tell you a lot of stories about what I've learned, but I'm going to try to impart some of my knowledge to you today. So, uh, I, blueberries are a minor crop of American origin, and it's a perennial shrub. It's not a tree, it's a perennial shrub. So, new shoots grow from the crown every year. It's like if you're familiar with raspberry or blackberry production, you've got new shoots from the ground. Same thing with blueberries, except the shoots last for a longer time. It bears its fruit on last year's wood. And so the amount of wood you grew last year determines your crop this year. If you don't grow any wood, then you don't get any fruit. It requires pruning to maintain young shoots. I find lots of people that are just starting out are afraid to prune because they don't want to reduce the crop. It does require moist soils. It does not like dry soils. It will stop growing and stay right there if you try to do that. So, let's talk a little bit more. It does require special soils. You can't grow it anywhere. It wasn't until 1910 that somebody figured out you needed acid soils. You need a soil pH between four and a half and five and a half. I have a lot of people that have soils at six, six and a half, that feel like they should be growing blueberries, and I call that blueberry fever, the irrational desire to grow blueberries, even if you can. So in Michigan, we usually grow them on acid sands or acid muck soils, and the soil should be moist but not wet. They really don't like to stand in standing water, and neither do cranberries, even though you see those two guys standing out there in a cranberry bog up to their hips in water, the cranberries are only flooded when you harvest them. It was originally a wetland plant. So this is a typical blueberry site in Michigan. It has a really porous, well-drained soil with a very high water table. I'm not a very bright guy, so I like to simplify things. And so I think of a plant as a straw with some uh, strings at the bottom for roots, and it's got, it's got a stem to transport water, leaves to make sugar, roots to pick up water from the soil. It's bearing fruit, which is why we're growing it. It's all made of cells, and cells grow, uh, they grow from meristems, we'll talk a little bit about that. And when you're talking about plant growth, you have to think about competition all the time, because the plant parts are competing for nutrients. So, uh, there's three ways that plants grow. Uh, they grow by cell division, by making more cells at the meristems. They grow by cell expansion. Once those cells have formed, they expand, and then they differentiate into the different types of cells they're going to be. And so once they've expanded and changed into a type cell, they're not going to change back and do anything else. So the only way you get new growth is by new cell division. And so cell division only occurs at the mac apical meristems, that's the shoot tips, and at the root tips. And there's also the cambium layer in the stems that makes bark to one side and wood to the other. And so we often talk of the different plant organs, stems, buds, leaves, fruits and flowers, there's an annual cycle of growth, and I'll talk about that several times so you understand what's going on with the blueberry plant. So the leaves are very important. They're green. They have chlorophyll in them. They harvest light from the sun. They combine it with carbon dioxide in the air and water from the soil to make sugar. Call that photosynthesis, and plants can make their own food. As long as they've got enough nutrients, um, they can do quite well. So let's take a look at a blueberry leaf. It's got stomates, which are little tiny holes in the bottom of the leaf. They open up to let air in, and when they do that, they evaporate water, and that's called transpiration. And that's a driving force in plants. If you take a look at that leaf, you see that it's entire, and it's thick and waxy. To me, that plant, that leaf is designed to conserve water. That's a plant that has a problem with water. The stems are there pretty much to provide support and transport water up from the roots through the xylem and then transport sugars through the bark from the leaves to wherever the sugars are needed. It also stores sugars and proteins right now. Um, those sugars and proteins are being remobilized in the wood and the bark to grow to the to 
go to the new buds and do growth in the springtime. And the roots, they anchor the plant in the soil. Their biggest job is to absorb water. They also absorb nutrients and they also serve a very important storage function for storing carbohydrates in the wintertime. Okay, so absorbing water is a passive process. The, plant, the roots don't actively take those, that water up. It is sucked from the ground by the plant. They do absorb minerals. A lot of that is passive. When the, when the water is drawn to the plant, it brings minerals with it. And some of that will just flow right into the plant. And others like nitrogen and phosphorus and potassium, when the plant sees it, it will grab onto it. And the root structure absorbed, and so blueberries are, that whole family, are pretty unique in that they lack root hairs. So they don't have any root hairs. They have a relatively small root system because they don't have the additional area of root hairs to pick up nutrients. And in the wild, they're supported by mycorrhizae fungi. They're mycorrhizae fungi that live on, or with the roots, and the plant supplies the fungi with sugar, and the fungi picks up nutrients from the soil and supplies them to the plant. And so I don't recommend any of you put any mycorrhizal mixes on when you plant because nobody has isolated and sold those commercially. So if you buy a mycorrhizal mix that works on oak trees or turf grass, it's not gonna work with blueberries. I talked about how they have a small shallow root system so this is what the inside of a root looks like. If you cut it in half and stained it with a microscope, the outside is the epidermis, and then there's the cortex, and then that brown layer is the, the area that restricts water use within, or water movement within the root. And so the water can move quite easily into the cortex of the root, and then it has to be actively transported inside the plant. So the roots don't leak an awful lot of water back out into the environment, except at the root tips. At the root tips, they will leak water back out into the environment, but as the, at, up at the top there, as the Casparian strip and the pericycle are well formed, it doesn't leak anything else. And so um, the white roots probably last for a matter of weeks two, maybe three weeks. I often think of roots as being the functional equivalent underground of leaves. They're there for a while and they absorb nutrients and if water disappears, the white roots disappear and about 99% of them die and 1% become these woody roots that can bring on new growth. So here's a picture of a blueberry root system. It was taken by Eric Hansen, uh, who works up at Michigan State and you can see that that's a very shallow root system. Blueberry roots only go 12 to 18 inches deep in the soil. They're not gonna be able to mine the soil deep like a grape or an apple tree to get water at depth. That surface layer has to be fairly moist and they have to have adequate uh, access to water. And you saw the high water table that I showed you at the beginning of a typical Michigan um, site. If you don't have that, then you have to irrigate. And you have to know how to irrigate talk a little bit about competition. When we talk about competition in a plant, we talk about sources and sinks. And so a source is something that produces something like carbohydrates in the leaves or water from the roots. Storage tissues can produce carbohydrates too that they've had stored for a while. And the sinks are where they go. The new growth, the new shoot growth, the fruit that you're growing, or new, new roots in the soil, wherever growth has to take place. And they all compete. Um, the analogy I like to use is the buffet at the conference, right? We all line up for lunch and we've got roast chicken and mashed potatoes and um, green beans. And the first guy gets all the roast chicken and mashed potatoes and green beans that he wants. If you're at the end of the line, you're lucky if there are mashed potatoes left and by then they've cooked some turkey loaf, hopefully, so that you can have. So if you're first in line, you get the lion's share of everything. So here's a quick picture of the annual cycle of growth of a blueberry plant. On the left, uh, the WT is the wilted tip from last year, and there's a shoot that grew this year, or last year. The FB is a flower bud at the top and a vegetative bud, and we're gonna walk through each one of those, and I'm going to explain what those look like. So at the beginning, 
the flower buds are located at the tips of the shoot. And in this one, in the picture, there's two of them. In the diagram, there's just one. And so um, growth begins at the tip of the shoot, and it, it works its way down. So here's a picture of a blueberry. And so you can see the flower bud at the top has begun to expand and break. And you can see that there are one, two, three, four, leaf buds below that that are become vegetative shoots and you can see that the one at the top is much farther along than the one at the bottom. So growth begins at the shoot tip and progresses on down. So in the spring those shoots grow very rapidly, the, the uh, flower bud begins to grow and so this is one of those vegetative shoots putting out new leaves and it grows quite rapidly in the springtime when it's got lots of carbohydrates that are available from the shoot from last year's growth. It's got lots of water coming from the ground because there's not an awful lot of demand for new roots. And so here's a picture of a couple of flowering blueberry shoots. Somebody cut the end of that one off, but you can see there's a nice picture of a shoot. And then uh, you can see the flowering shoot at, on the right. It had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That's a very productive shoot, seven flower buds. And you can see that the ones at the tip bloomed, and you can see that they already have fruit on them, the ones in the middle are in full bloom, and the ones at the bottom haven't even opened up yet. So if I get a freeze at that point in time that goes just cold enough to kill green fruit, I lose the green fruit, maybe a couple of the open flowers, but nothing else. So I talk to blueberry growers, they tell me, I ask because I come from tree fruit, where apples and cherries and peaches can be wiped out by a freeze, did you ever lose anything? And they almost all answer no, but I lost enough not to be profitable. So here's another picture of active spring growth, and you can see that those shoots are growing really fast. You can see bloom is ending, and by then, we've got eight inches of new growth, and we've got new leaves coming out of the tip. That shoot is actively growing. When the midsummer comes along, so I've got fruit growing, and I've got shoots growing at the same time, and they're both competing with water. At some point in time, uh, shoot growth begins to slow because the plant is mobilizing its reserves to make the fruit. And so eventually, in many days, I'll be out early in the spring in Michigan. It's usually the end of April, middle of May, and we'll have a hot day. And I'll see the shoot tips wilt. And that's the only day that I'll see shoot tips wilt. And after that, that um, at, the, at the very shoot tip, that tip will die and the shoot will stop growing for the year. So here's a picture of what that looks like. And I get calls from people saying, uh, you know, there's a little black leaf at the end of the shoot, you know. I'm worried about what that is, and that's perfectly normal. That's the way the shoot stops growing. That first shoot ends, and you can see right below the black leaf, there is a leaf bud in the axle of the leaf, and there's a leaf bud in the axle of all those leaves down there. And later in the season, those will change to fruit buds. So here's the difference between uh, actively growing shoot on the left, and you can see new leaves, new small leaves at the shoot tip, as opposed to the one on the right where all the leaves are the same size. It's quit growing and it won't grow again until conditions are right. And so in Michigan, we get about one and a half flushes of growth. In Oregon, they get like four, three, four, it just keeps growing and growing and growing. They have much different conditions you probably will get multiple uh, flushes of growth here in Virginia. And so late in the summer, we begin to have these leaf buds that are at the shoot tip change to flower buds. And each flower bud's gonna have eight to 12 flowers in it, have eight to 12 berries. Um, and if conditions are really right, we'll have multiple flower buds forming as we go down. So we'll have two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight flower buds on a shoot. Of course, we'll we have to have a big enough shoot to support that. We can't get an awful lot of flower buds on a shoot that's two inches long. And so here's a picture of what they look like in the fall. And you can go out there and you can pull back the leaves and you can actually see how many flower buds there are formed on the plant for next spring. This is a diagram of uh, shoot, root, and uh, growth in blueberries. Across the top, you've got leaf bud swell, first bloom, flowering, fruit set and bloom and then flower formation again at the end and you can see this first peak is the shoot starting to grow and they grow really fast for a while and then they stop and then there's a second or maybe even a third flush of growth 
And you see the roots don't grow very much. At the beginning, there's plenty of water in the soil, and later in the season, there is uh, more uh, carbohydrates available. So what is suppressing the growth in the middle of the season? Is it lack of water? No, it's fruit growth. And so the fruit are taking nutrients away from the shoots and suppressing root growth. And so, and that's why we're growing the plant, right? We want lots of big berries. So let's talk a little bit about fruit growth. Uh, it's a double sigmoidal curve, means that it starts real fast and slows down and then takes off again. There's competition between the fruits. If you notice that flower I should that flowering cluster I showed you, I should change this and put in another one. But actually, the flower at the base of the, of the cluster blooms first, and then they bloom up, up. And so you can see there are large and small fruits in each one of those clusters. The largest fruit was the first fruit that was formed. It's first in the buffet line. It gets as much food as it wants. The small fruit are always going to be small. They will never be as big as that big fruit is. So here's a diagram of large berries, medium-sized berries, and small berries their growth through the growing season. Let's see here. Oops, no, I'm going to go back. So in the beginning, that first flush of growth is cell division. And then cell division stops, and it changes to cell expansion. And you can see that at the end. But you can see that the small fruit on the bottom never really gets as big as that big fruit would have been. I said the, flower, the fruit buds formed on last year's wood, and here you can see that flowering shoot again that shows all those fruit buds and so vigorous shoots generally have lots of flowers and grow vigorous new shoots for next year at the base. You can see at the bottom of that picture on the top, you can see new shoots coming that are already three, four inches long. They're going to be nice long shoots like the one that, um, um, that produced it next year. At the bottom are some pictures of shoot growth from pr plants that are old and haven't been pruned very often. And so you can see they have one flower bud and one leaf bud with tiny little leaves on it. You're not going to get big fruit off those flower clusters. They're just too old. The most fruitful canes are those that are three, four, five, or six years old. Tell my growers by the time they're eight years old, they're ready for the rest home. You know, <laughs> got to cut them out, and we want to grow. I think of a blueberry bush as a fountain. You know, it's always putting up new shoots from the ground, and I'm always taking the old ones off. To make room for the new guys coming. You know, the old people have to retire and free up those jobs for the new people. I'll talk a little bit about the benefits of mulches. Um, my growers say if you start mulching them, they become addicted to mulch, you know, and so that's worthwhile. It increases the organic matter, and I find organic matter uh, cures an awful lot of sins in poor blueberry sites. It does provide micronutrients and increases the fertility of the topsoil, and that's interesting. Um, but it also increases the water holding capacity of that soil because it cools it and protects it from evaporation directly. So we have more water underneath the mulch than we normally would. Cools the soil in a hot summer. I don't think blueberries particularly like hot weather. I figure any time it gets up above 80, they're probably wishing they were someplace else. And blueberry roots really love that interface between the soil and the mulch. I had a guy send me pictures once from Fredericksburg here in uh, Virginia where um, he had planted blueberries and put mulch on top of them and the soil was very heavy and the blueberries didn't like that, but they really liked the mulch. So he had a large root system in the mulch and nothing in the soil. You can see the original root system had essentially died. Yeah, so for them, a, a mulch is an awful lot like the natural conditions that they would be growing in. And so here's uh, someone else's master's thesis. And so he grew blueberry bushes under a mulch and not under a mulch. And so you can see the one on the left was not mulched. The one on the right is mulched. So who likes the one on the left? Who likes the one on the right? So what's the difference? The root system. There's the difference of having moist soil versus soil that dries out quickly. And so mulching greatly increases the number of fine roots and the plant's ability to extract water and nutrients out of the soil. So what's a good blueberry site? Well, I tell people if the pH isn't below six, figure out something else to grow. There must be something else that you can grow that will make lots of money. It doesn't have to be blueberries. 
You need moist soil, which means that you need the ability to irrigate, and if you've got really wet soils, you better provide drainage. I think the best soils are those where you can control the water. When it needs water, you give it water, and when it's got too much water, you take it away. There's always going to be problem sites. There's always going to be places in the field where they're not doing well for any one reason. I went to China once. Somebody called me up and wanted me to go to China and look at blueberries, and I said, I don't want to go to China. What do you need? And he said, I just need you to go and look at the site, you know, and tell me if you'll grow blueberries. I said, well, how big is the site? And he said, 25,000 acres. 25,000 acres? That's bigger than all of Michigan. My guys plant an acre, and there's a quarter of it that they can't figure out what's wrong with it. And you're just going to go plant on 25,000 acres. I don't have to worry too much about this industry, because they might get 1,000 acres out of all that that's worth growing blueberries on. And so fixing the problem in the soil might be, might cost or will cost oftentimes more than it's worth, unless you're in an uh, area where you can sell blueberries for a very high price and there's few places in the world left like that. Um, if, you're, if your market is people driving out of Richmond or some other large city, then you can afford to charge retail if you're doing UPIC, but if you're a Michigan grower, you're picking along with 10 million other pounds, and so for those guys, spending an awful lot of money to try and fix a small area of the field is more money than it's worth just to not grow blueberries there. So let's talk about establishment, some of the do's and don'ts. Pre-plant decisions are choosing the right site and then figuring out what's wrong with it so you can prepare it. Try to, to, to avoid uh, planting mistakes, and there's a bunch of them. And there's cultural mistakes, you know, oh, irrigation costs too much money, you know. Isn't there a spray that will double yields? No, I don't know of any fertilizer that will double yields, but irrigation generally will. Herbicides, using the wrong herbicides. I took a bunch of those slides out so you don't have to look at herbicide mistakes. And then mulching, we talked about that, so we won't talk about it too much more. So the first thing I look at is, is it an acid soil? Or can I make it an acid soil? Is it a naturally moist soil? Does it have poor drainage? Is there a water table close to the surface? And if there is, then is drainage needed? Now, I don't know what your soils look like here in Virginia, but that's what a good blueberry soil in Michigan looks like, black sand on top of white sand with a, with a, with a high water table. So uh, do a pH test. If it's below 5.5, proceed. It's best if it's between 5 and Four and a half, you know, the literature says 4.8, 4.7, 4.9, wherever you read. I find that uh, generally by the time you get down to 4.3, you're, you're thinking about raising the pH, but until you get below four and a half, all you're trying to do is lower the soil pH. You can use sulfur to lower the soil pH. If you've got plants standing, we generally recommend no more than 500 pounds of sulfur to the acre if you've got plants in the field. If you do it beforehand, you can add a lot more sulfur. But if you've got plants in the field and you try to add a thousand pounds or something, you probably stunt the plants for years. Order the plants. Figure out what you want to grow. I get that question an awful lot. What's the best variety to grow? And I go, well, you know, they're all blue. We don't, we don't really sell them, you know, by, by name. Uh, if you're doing a UPIC operation, you want a wide variety. You want to figure out what grows well and you want something that's picking during the season that you are in. So you want something early, something early mid-season, something mid-season, something late season. So you'll have blueberries there. Any one blueberry bush is only going to pick for a week or two. You know, really good varieties might pick for three weeks. And so if you want to be open for three weeks, plant just one variety. Or if you want to be open for two months, plant three or four or five varieties. Control the perennial weeds before you plant. Once they're in the ground, it's really hard to control perennial weeds because it's a perennial plant and things that kill perennial weeds do a pretty good job on blueberries. And determine if drainage is needed and put it in. And prepare your irrigation system because you're going to need it the first year they're in the ground. So we'll talk a little bit about soil pH. And so essentially blueberries are in that zone that's in the far left. And so they're adapted to pick up nutrients that, are, that have that availability. And so if we get extreme soil pHs, we get extreme deficiencies. And so um, we try to make the 
just as, and so oftentimes when I go to a new planting, the plants look like this. And I go, what's your soil pH? And they go, oh, five and a half. And in fact, I guess I had that happen to me in China. I'd go, and I'd say, what's the soil pH? And they'd say, five and a half. You know, and after I'd been to 12 places, and they'd say, five and a half anymore, I quit asking, because I figured they knew the answer in the book, and that was the answer they were given. <laughs> And so we were looking at plants like this, and I said, so what's the soil pH? And they said, oh, five and a half. And I said, oh, it looks like six and a half to me. And there were pieces of charcoal around the plants, and I said, are they putting wood ash on these things? And they talked for a little bit, and they said, well, they don't know the soil pH, and yes, they are putting wood ash on it. And I want to stop that, you know. Um, you need to put on something else. So wood ash will raise the soil pH. Uh, we can use fertilizers to lower the soil pH. Uh, generally, blueberries only like ammonium fertilizers. If you put nitrate on them, they don't see it. It's wasted nitrogen. Uh, and ammonium sulfate will lower the soil pH. Uh, elemental sulfur before planting can lower the soil pH. If you're in a big hurry, you can buy iron sulfate and put on six times as much as you do with the sulfur. And that will act fairly quickly. That's a chemical reaction. When we put on sulfur, that's a bacterial reaction. There are actually bacteria in the soil will take the sulfur and, com and combine it with oxygen in the air and make sulfuric acid and lower the soil pH. That takes a year, maybe two. I have to keep the soil moist, make sure it's not too moist. It's not a rapid chemical reaction. It's a slow biological process. I get people to put it on in the fall and figure that they ought to be able to plant in the springtime. The bacteria didn't have any time to work on it. I get people to double up, say, I'll put it on in the fall, and the next year in the spring, I'll put it on again. Well, I just put on a thousand pounds, you know, so. The conversion takes a long time. I generally tell people that it takes at least a year, put the sulfur on, check the soil pH at the end of the growing season, figure out if you need more sulfur. And so this is the amount of sulfur that you would need for different types of soils. If your soil pH is seven and you're growing on sand, you need 840 pounds of sulfur. If you're uh, growing on a heavy clay, you're going to need almost two tons of sulfur to convert it. If you put two tons of sulfur on the ground, I can almost guarantee you that no plant will grow in that site for several years. It will burn the roots off. Okay, so don't plant, don't be in a hurry, don't get blueberry fever, don't plant before the soil amendments have a chime to work. Mistakes made at the beginning have long, long consequences. When you plant the plant, do break up the root ball when you're planting. A lot of people just pop it out of the pot, stick it in the ground. If there's a big difference between the soil that they're growing in and the, and the peat, they won't come out of the peat. The peat's a really nice place to have roots. And as long as it's moist, you're okay. It grows real well, puts out a lot of leaves. One hot day, it sucks all the water out of the peat, and the plant is drought stressed for the rest of its life because it's really hard to get the peat wet again. So a lot of times I tell people, add some peat, add some organic matter to the planting hole to make that transition from the pot to the soil easier. Do mulch the plants and uh, do irrigate the planting. So here's an example of a plant I went and visited. So that's a three-year-old blueberry bush. Wasn't doing particularly well, you know. And I said, well, you know, that peat pot, did you break that up? Oh yeah, you know, well, it didn't do a very good job of it. If you'd added a little bit of organic matter to the soil, it would have worked. Um, the plant right there is a good candidate for mulching. And my recommendation essentially was mulch them and cut the top off the plant. Those shoots that you see will never be good shoots. When you get a plant from the nursery, unless you want to pick it next year, my recommendation is to cut all the shoots off of it and force it to grow new shoots. The shoots that you bought from the nursery we're only there to keep it alive until you've got it and it's really doing well if you want to keep the one-year-old shoots the shoots that grew the year before you planted that's fine but all the two-year-old ones should probably be gone you're trying to establish a plant and growing a plant as fast as possible not try to pick blueberries the next year nobody likes to pick blueberries oh i mean it looked just like the peat underneath that tarp but the roots never came out of the soil, and when it got dry, it really did poorly. I said, can I take this home, plant it in my backyard? He said, yeah, sure. So that plant grew quite well for quite a few years. I assume it still is, because I've sold that house. 
but uh, I've told several people, and they're always really kind of shocked when they say, what can I do? And I say, dig up the plant and replant it, because it's never going to do well. And when you do replant it, cut off half the growth. Put it back where it wants to be. So here's an example of breaking up that root ball. This grower put uh, organic matter on top of his beds and rototilled it in in the spring and then did it again in the fall and then planted. Planting in the fall is real common in Michigan because most of our sites are too wet to plant in the spring. So we tried to get our planting done in September and October. Uh, this is a more traditional system that we use and we have newer production systems that are bringing the fields into production more quickly. And so here's one that's common in Oregon and becoming common in Michigan. They're planting into a bed of wood chips. They have double irrigation lines and those lines are located above the soil so they can do easy maintenance and it gets it away from the little critters that are down in the mulch that like to chew on irrigation lines. The big problem with this is that uh, you, get, you do get weeds in the mulch and it's hard to control them. The other problem is that uh, mulch is kind of hard to come by. Of course, people often ask me, what's the best mulch, you know, and I say, the best mulch is the one you can get your hands on, you know, the worst mulch is one that's got black walnut in it. Out in Oregon, they use lots of Douglas fir uh, sawdust because they have unlimited quantities of Douglas fir sawdust, but we just grind up anything we can find and use it in Michigan. Another system that's becoming really, really common is uh, woven plastic mulch, much like uh, the vegetable production systems. I do not recommend using a solid plastic sheet. I've seen plantings go in using a solid plastic sheet and the, the blueberries might like them, depending on the variety, or they might just die. It seems to be too wet and too warm underneath that mulch, but the woven plastic mulch works really, really good. In this system, there are two irrigation lines located underneath the uh, bed, one on each side of the plant, and this grower fertilizes quite heavily. He puts on twice as much fertilizer as I would recommend, but he gets really good growth and he plans on being in production really, really quickly. Uh, we're going to hit the slide button once there, and so that's what a three-year-old plant looks like under that system. It's bigger than I am. And that, it, for me, that's a six, eight-year-old plant in Michigan. So he has doubled. Um, it's going to be in production, you know, the next year. The big conversation there is should I pick in the third or the fourth year? I get calls from people who want to know how many pounds of blueberries they can pick the first year. I go, well, if you're smart, you won't pick any. You'll pick all the flowers off. You're growing a bush for the first three or four years. And then you want to start to harvest the berries. I do have growers and small pick-your-own operations that will buy the biggest bush they can get their hands on, plant them, and pick them the next year. They're perfectly happy with that system, but they're not producing large volumes of berries. Okay, let's talk a little bit about fertilizer. You need to use the correct uh, nutrients. So a soil test will tell you what's in the soil, but it won't tell you what the plants are getting from the soil. Uh, we generally recommend leaf analysis, but a lot of people think $30 is way too much money, you know, but you get an awful lot more information out of a leaf analysis. When you think about uh, fertilizers um, and plant nutrition, you have to think about the law of the minimum. And the law of the minimum means that um, the plant's only going to grow as well as the one nutrient that, that's deficient in. When it gets to the point where it's deficient in that nutrient, it will stop growing. You give it that nutrient, it will grow some more until something else is deficient. So you're always playing this game. Blueberry growers buy an awful lot of foliar feeds, uh, a lot of foliar um, sprays. I think, yeah, you know, I can put some urea and a little bit of iron chelate in the tank and I can bring the plant up in three days. But did that increase your yield any this year? Did it increase your yield any next year? Did you leave a check? I don't see the benefit unless you know why you're putting the micronutrient on. And if we put on too much of a nutrient, well, the plant goes thanks and consumes that, but I don't get an increase in yield. If I'm growing a, a tomato or corn, I can fertilize and that increases my yield. I'm growing a perennial plant and it recycles its nutrients every year. 
And so if I put more fertilizer on, I probably get a bigger plant. I might get more growth, but if I have too much fertilizer late in the season and the shoots are growing, it's not going to make flower buds for next year. It's going to be growing shoot and not making flower buds. Blueberries are perennial plants. They recycle the nutrients that they have every year. So if they're in really good shape, plants, you know, the leaves turn red and all those nutrients go back into the stems for growth next year. And so fertilizer this year, you're going to see the impact of fertilizer this year, next year, and you're going to have, uh, and so if I get increased growth this year, with any luck at all, I get increased yields next year. But too much fertilizer, I get too much growth, and that's going to suppress yields. And I see lots of people try to fertilize their way out of a problem, and so that usually ends up with really, really sad plants. You know, oh, the plant's not growing too well, I'll put some fertilizer on it. Well, that didn't seem to work. I'll put some more fertilizer on it. Well, that didn't seem to work. And so, um, essentially, you end up salting the plant out. Uh, blueberries don't like a lot of chloride, and they don't like a real salty environment. So, this picture is really hard to see, but... Um, so, they only use ammonium nitrogen, and generally, we recommend a split application, one at bud break and one right around bloom because the plants don't use an awful lot of nitrogen before they have leaves on them. We put more on sandy soils, which don't hold an awful lot of nutrients, and in many cases, we might not put much on a heavier soil that holds a lot of nutrients. Mulching is going to increase the demand for nitrogen. So if I mulch, we generally recommend doubling the amount of nitrogen that you put on the plant. And so in this plant, you can see, in this picture, you can see there's a small light green plant on the left side of the picture and a large dark green plant on the right. And that small plant is grown in sawdust mulch with no nitrogen, and the one on the uh, right is growing with nitrogen. So that's what you're going to see if they're not getting enough nitrogen. You'll have small leaves and small, um, small everything, not enough nitrogen. So generally for the ammonium fertilizers, uh, urea is a good choice, and we recommend urea if the, if the soil pH is below five, because urea has a tendency not to lower the soil pH as quickly as it should. And so um, generally if the pH is higher than we want, we recommend ammonium sulfate, and so that will lower the pH faster than urea. And so generally when we talk about fertilizers and you're going to go buy a ton of fertilizer and you think I'll buy the cheapest ton, that generally isn't the case. If urea costs $605 a ton and it's 46% nitrogen, then we have 920 pounds of nitrogen in a ton of urea. Ammonium sulfate, we would have 420 pounds per ton, but if we did the math, we'd see that the urea is 66 cents a pound for nitrogen and the ammonium sulfate is almost a dollar a pound for nitrogen. So you look at the cost of the nitrogen when you're pricing your fertilizer, not the price of the fertilizer itself. So this is the general recommended rate for nitrogen for blueberry plants. Um, we generally recommend for young plantings about 15 pounds to the acre and about uh, 30 and 40 and up to 65 to 70 pounds to get good growth on the plant every year. A lot of people try to fertilize a lot so they get more growth and cut back on pruning. I don't believe that's a good case. But you can see the different amounts of fertilizer that are needed. A lot of small growers will fertilize plants individually. And so there's the recommendation for you all to take a picture of real quick for individual plants. Um, be careful. Be careful when you fertilize get a lot of new growers that just throw it right on the plant so the plant can use it right away. This guy called me up and said the, the frost had killed his plants and I went and looked, you know, and I said, yeah, well, they look dead to me, but it looks like you might have put fertilizer on it. Well, yeah, I did. I just put it right around the plants. And I said, oh, well, that's it. Because all that fertilizer, when it dissolves, is going to be a very salty solution, so burn the roots of these plants. And most of them died. And he was kind enough to send me a picture he took with his cell phone of what the fertilizer application looked like right after he did it. But if you put fertilizer right on top of the plant like that, uh, it's going to burn the roots. And I can tell you from 24 years of experience in extension, a lot of people do that. A lot of people put fertilizer too close, especially if they fertilize after planting. They'll put the fertilizer down uh, in the loose soil and go right down to the roots.
soil test, pre-plant. So I talked about nutrient levels are generally higher in heavier soils. Uh, the relative importance of nutrients, we could argue about that, but generally a suitable balance of calcium, magnesium, and potassium in the soil is about 60 to 80 percent calcium, 15 to 30 percent manganese, and 10 to 15 percent uh, potash. And so when we look at phosphorus fertilizers, I'm not a big fan of phosphorus fertilizers unless you need them. Uh, phosphorus becomes a problem in the water. I generally like the ammonium phosphates because they dissolve fairly quickly. And so there's MAP and there's DAP, diammonium phosphate, and then there's mono or poly, poly, polyammonium phosphate. And so all of those are essentially phosphoric acid mixed with ammonia. And so they dissolve fairly quickly and they're fairly easy for the plant to take up. And they acidify pretty well too. For potash fertilizers, we generally recommend potassium sulfate. Uh, we recommend a material called SOPOMAG, or it's got many other names, but essentially it's got a fair amount of magnesium and sulfur in it. Uh, blueberries, I like to say blueberries don't like calcium. Blueberries like magnesium. People that say that you got to put calcium on blueberries to get firm fruit um, are going from the fact that, oh, in apples, calcium's important. In tomatoes, calcium is important. It must be important in blueberries. It ain't necessarily so. Blueberries are a little bit different. Um, I only put calcium on if calcium is deficient, and I've never seen calcium deficiency. Sometimes we use potassium chloride. That's like the cheapest fertilizer there is, but we don't want to put a lot of that because blueberries don't like chloride. So generally we'll put that on in the fall when the, the chloride will leach out of the soil. They're perennial plants. Like I say, they recycle their nutrients, so the soil availability of a nutrient is a really poor way to determine how you're going to fertilize. We really recommend that you do leaf samples to figure out what's going on. And those leaf samples should be taken in late July after shoot growth ends. Take a leaf from the middle of 100 plants, middle of the shoot of 100 plants, put them all together. Generally, our growers only take leaf samples if there's something deficient. And if you're trying to figure out what's wrong with one portion of the field, take a sample from one portion, that portion of the field and take a sample from the other portion of the field so the poor guy that looks at it can see if there's a difference. Oftentimes, the soil test and the tissue test don't look like they came from the same field. And so you have to kind of wonder what's going on. And it's important to know whether or not you had a heavy crop of fruit or if you had really lush growth that year. I'm stuck again. There we go. So these are the levels for uh, blueberry leaf analysis. And so generally we're looking at about 2% of the leaf to be nitrogen, about uh, you know, a very small portion is phosphorus, uh, potassium, and then a little bit of calcium. And you can see that the magnesium is up there pretty close to what the uh, calcium is. So let's talk about irrigating. So water is very important for photosynthesis. It's used to transport materials throughout the plant. It's vital for growth. Uh, we get reduced water, we get smaller plants, get smaller stems, smaller leaves, smaller fruit. Reduced water means the plant's gonna mobilize reserves to the roots and try to grow more roots and get more water. So plants use very little water if they don't have any leaves on them. If they're not evaporating water out of leaves, they don't use water. As the leaves grow, the plant water use increases. It begins to use water for photosynthesis and the big driver is transpiration. It uses it to pump up all the organs, make the fruit nice and big at the beginning. And so let's talk a little bit about the soil plant atmosphere continuum. The evaporation actually pulls the water out of the plant. So the evaporation from the atmosphere sucks water out of the leaves. By sucking water out of the leaves, you pull that water from the stems into the leaves and you pull that water out of the ground and evaporate it from the leaves. So evaporation from the leaves is a driving force for water use. If the stomates close and it stops losing water, photosynthesis stops. If the stomates close and it stops using water, nutrient uptake stops. So you want the plant to be able to use as much water as it wants. You're not trying to save water, you're trying to optimize growth of the plant, and that requires water. So if the plant looks like this, very minimal demand. 
don't have to irrigate very much when the plant looks like that. And, and that's uh, mid-April here up in Michigan. But when it looks like that, it got maximum demand. You've got a heavy load of fruit, you have a heavy, heavy load of leaves, it's a hot day, we use a lot of water. So water management, irrigation provides supplemental water and maintains the water in the soil. So if we've got drainage, we have excess water, we move that away. Mulching will reduce evaporation and moderates the soil temperature. And as I showed you, they have a very small root system. They've got leaves that are designed to conserve water. They don't have root hairs. Moving water in that plant is a problem. So talk about shoot growth, fruit growth, and fruit set for next year. And so they don't manage water well. And so this is what drought stress looks like. If you don't have a, a non-irrigated field and the leaves start turning brown and I get called and I say, yeah, they're not getting enough water. Um, shuts down the leaves. We don't see wilting very often in blueberries. That thick waxy leaf can't wilt. It just loses water and burns up. Um, and so this is what it looks like. If it doesn't rain all summer and you go, we've never had to irrigate that field. And I say, well, I can see the spots where you've got heavier soil that holds more water. In a situation like that, my recommendation was just cut down all those brown shoots. They're never going to come back. Just start over again. That's what the fruit looked like. You know, you can sell them as wild, you know. But. So we talked about how much water is the plant using, how much water can the soil hold, how much water can you apply, and how much rain have you received. And I think with blueberries, the soil should be recharged before it gets to 50% of the available water has been used. So we talk about how much water can your soil store, how much is the plant using, that's evapotranspiration. Did you get any precipitation? You make up the rest with irrigation. And so sandy soils don't hold an awful lot of water, so we have to irrigate more often. Let's see, what's the trick? So generally in sandy soils, we have smaller, more frequent irrigations. We really don't want to irrigate past that 18 inches where the blueberry roots are. We're going to move fertilizer and we're going to move water past the root zone. So we only want to wet the area where the blueberries are. So depending on what type of soil you have, you can hold different amounts of uh, water. And so that's the amount of water they can hold per inch, per cubic inch. And this is inches per foot, which is when we talk about an inch of rain, we got an inch of rain over an acre. And if we got an inch and a, inch and a quarter of rain on a sandy soil, we wet that soil down a foot deep. If we have a loamy soil, we can hold two and a quarter inches of water in that soil. And so in blueberries in Michigan, the daily water use, we've got monthly water use in May, June, July, and so we've got pretty much full leaf canopy by the end of June. We generally bloom the middle of May in Michigan, and we have a full leaf canopy in June and July and August. The big driver, is how many leaves do we have and how hot is it? And so generally we're looking at in the summertime in July, you can see on that right hand uh, column that we're using almost two tenths of an inch of water a day. The best analogy I can think of is if you're dressed in a dark green suit and you go out and stand in a sunny field, how hot do you get? And the plant is cooling down by evaporating water through its leaves. And so generally in that soil, if, we're, if we've got, that, if we've got um, 18 inch deep root system, that's how much water those different types of soils can hold. So generally we don't give more than an inch of water when we're irrigating a sandy soil. And so I want a half inch of, I want a half inch of water still to be there, so I'm never watering more than a half inch. My growers in July, when they have to water a lot, will water every two or three days if they have to. But they're continually recharging the, the soil to put more water into it. And so how often do I have to irrigate? Well, in May, you have to irrigate once a month. That first irrigation is pretty important, right around bloom. Thank you. Um, got five days, two and a half days for one week. So I got to hurry. I got to hurry. So recharge. Irrigation types. Trickle irrigation. It's cheap, got a slow application rate, 
We use a lot of sprinkler irrigation. It's expensive. We use lots of water, but we use it for frost protection. We'll turn on the overhead sprinklers when we're getting a freeze, and we will um, protect those blossoms. We can protect them to about down to 25, 24 degrees under the right conditions. So we will irrigate during bloom if there's a freeze. So how much water does the plant use? Well, you know, I've got an acre inch is 27,000 gallons, two tenths of an inch. We talked about how that was kind of maximum. So that acre is using about 5,400 gallons of water a day. If I planted my plants 10 feet and 10 foot rows, three feet apart, those plants are using about four gallons of water a day. And so critical time is bloom, berry sizing, and flower bud formation. A lot of growers turn off the irrigation system after harvest because, you know, plants don't need water. They're making flower buds for next year. Let's talk real quickly about pruning in the couple minutes I have left. So when we prune, we want to remove the older, less productive wood. And so generally people are afraid to prune. The, the plant on the right there has been pruned. You see that brightly colored wood is young wood, and that dark wood is uh, older wood that's been pruned out. On um, the picture on the left, you can you don't see very many shoots. But when you look at the new shoots on the right, and you see there are lots of flower buds on those shoots because they were pruned quite well. So pruning young bushes, the first couple of seasons, I say take off all the flower buds, strip off and prune, remove all that spindly low stuff that's close to the ground. It's never gonna. You want upright shoots that are growing well. Nobody likes to pick blueberries on their knees. So here's a young elegant plant before we pruned it and after. See, we removed an awful lot of wood. You think, oh my God, it cut off half the crop. Well, the berries that remain will be larger and we'll have better fruit the next year and the next year. If we stop pruning, we won't see a decline right away, but over time we'll see the, the berry size goes down as we've got older and older bushes and it takes longer to rehabilitate them. So we want to promote the growth of new replacement canes, open up the canopy to flower bud initiation, get lots of light in there. It also reduces disease. We want to balance the leaf area and the fruit load to get really good berry size. And generally we want the bush to be narrow and we want the fruiting wood to be off the ground. So anything that's lower than your knees, if it's going to have fruit on it, should probably be cut off because nobody likes to pick blueberries on their knees. So here's an example of an old blueberry bush. There's the one two-year-old shoots three and five year old shoots, and then those six and eight year old shoots, those are the ones that have to come off. We generally recommend taking two or three of those off every year to promote new shoots coming up from the ground. And so there's an optimum, you know, everybody's different, but generally we like one to two year old canes to take up part, and, but most of the bushes, most of the canes we want to be that three to five year old uh, cane. So here's a picture in the winter time, before and after. Before people, generally we cut off right at, the, right at the base. We don't spend an awful lot of time pruning the top of the bush. We're trying to move as quickly as we can, make three or four cuts per bush and move to the next one. We've got 1,500 to do in this acre and we've got three acres. We only have so much time. So, but we will do uh, clean up pruning where this is a new, these are new fruitful upright shoots there, and, but the end of the bush isn't too good, so let's just get rid of it. Um, the rest of this is just about pest management. Uh, I could stop and take questions. We've got a couple minutes left. Should we do that? I'd like to do that, right? Okay. Yes, ma'am. When's the best time to prune? Best time to prune is when you have time. The worst time to prune is between uh, Labor Day and Thanksgiving because the plant's getting ready for winter. And so generally we try to prune after the, that, that coldest part of the winter goes by and uh, we don't have to worry about really cold. Of course, up in Michigan, we worry about minus 20 degrees. That doesn't happen down here too much. Most of our plants are, are hurt when it gets down below minus 10. But generally I'd say, from the winter until bud break. If you're in a big hurry, you know, the big guys, they start right after harvest and finish at bloom. Another question? No? Okay. Um, talking about pruning, you've got a six to eight year old massive cane you want to take out, but you've got a nice new cane coming off the base. I, I, okay, so if I've got new canes coming off the old cane, I would prune to the new cane. I don't necessarily have to take the whole thing off. What I want are, are, are new shoots coming and sometimes some varieties 
don't like to throw new shoots. A lot of times, if the, if if the cane bends over, it will throw new shoots. So I'll prune to those new canes. Okay. You had a question. Um, the blossoms pick them off at least three years, if not four years. Um, it really depends on how, uh, but generally they're very easy to pick off. You can see them and you can just strip them off. I recommend at least two years. Okay. Most of my growers now are going like, I really want the money, you know, I've got to have the money. Uh, really depends on how well the bush is growing. If, if, because you will stunt the bush. If you let it fruit, it will stop. Grow, it, will, it will really slow down growth. Another question? Yes, sir. But you, but you had to Comes out and the end of it dies. Oh. Should you trim that sheet back or just let it go? Yeah. Um, it all, yeah. So generally, I would I would cut that out. But you probably won't be spending an awful lot of quality time out there doing fine pruning. Uh, but I would I would cut it out when I notice it. Generally, there's a pretty good chance that's a disease, and so. If you don't like to spray, sanitation is a good way to control disease. So he's talking about a new shoot that comes up and then the shoot tip dies. And should he, should he cut that out? And I said, if you got time, yeah. Another, yes, sir. Is there any way you can propagate? Oh, they're extremely easy to propagate. You go out and you collect woody, uh, woody tissue, you know, this last year's shoot. And we cut them into three bud things and we stick them into uh, peat and they root and I've got new bushes. It's a really good way to propagate blueberries and their virus diseases. We have a big problem with growers because they're so easy to propagate, they, they propagate their own plants and so I won't even talk about virus diseases but it's a big problem for us. So I recommend that you buy your virus certified plants from a nursery that grows blueberries. Uh, generally, they will be propagating um, some of the new ones. Do I would I would try to make my order a year before I wanted to plant them. If my soil was at six, eight, or seven right now, and I had the uncontrollable desire to grow blueberries, I'd be growing them on a on a raised bed of sawdust. <coughs> and, uh, In my opinion, yes. Down in uh, Florida and Georgia, they actually do that system because they're grown on so crappy fresh, soil. Fresh brown mulch. I don't like fresh brown mulch because it's breaking down. It's going to release an awful lot of stuff. So generally, we age it for a yep. year. One year. Mm -hmm. And then just plant white and mulch. Yep. And then, and then mulch thereafter. Yes, you have to keep mulching because the mulch keeps disappearing. Right. And once the roots start to show up on the surface, you're worried about spraying with herbicides. You had a question. Yeah. Organic uh, fertilizers, feather meal, uh, blood meal, for nitrogen, a slower release, obviously. What do you recommend for nitrogen? Um, I can't. Oh, see, what are you asking about? Or organic fertilizers, and I haven't given that any thought. I'd have to go um, look that up and think about that for a while. I wouldn't recommend any manures. A lot of people put manure in a planting hole or whatnot, and that's going to raise the soil pH. So uh, I don't like manures uh, simply because it raises the soil pH, and now I have a pH problem. That's hard to fix. Okay. 